Uh, thank you for coming. I know that some of you have uh, uh, are guests from another class, and I know that being in here with me brings back fond memories uh, of reporting. Uh, the rest of you are actually in reporting. So uh, people have asked if they could take pictures. It's perfectly all right. Uh, we have nothing to hide. Uh, and so uh, our guest today is, uh, as you know, Hall Rains, uh, who is an Alabama uh, Alabama boy, roll tide. Can I say that in here without getting booed? Probably not. Boo! He was born in Birmingham. He got his Bachelor of Arts in English from Birmingham Southern College. He has a master's degree in English from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. He has honorary doctorates from uh, both. Uh, his newspaper career uh, started in, in Alabama, his short TV career. Uh, uh, and then uh, back to newspapers, he was the political editor at the Atlantic Constitution, the political editor at the St. Petersburg Times. That's how I got to know uh, Powell. Uh, he joined the Atlanta Bureau of the New York Times in 1978, and in his 25 years at the Times, he was assistant bureau chief, Atlanta bureau chief, national uh, political correspondent, the London bureau chief, the Washington editor, the editorial page editor, and uh, on September 5th, 2001, <laughs> Cue the organ. Uh, six days before the plane hit the towers, he became executive editor of the New York Times, responsible for covering that uh, incredible event. He's written four books so far, Whiskey Man, a novel, uh, My Soul is Rested, an oral history of the civil rights uh, in the South, and two memoirs. Uh, the first one, Fly Fishing Through My Midlife Crisis, and the second one, after he had left the Times, about fishing and his tenure at the Times, The One That Got Away, which I think is great. He and his wife, Kristen. Let's put their time between Fairhope, Alabama, and Henryville, <coughs> Pennsylvania. And I'm going to start the questioning, but I would like you to start thinking of some questions to ask yourself because it's, it's a different crowd than we had last night at the Graham Center, and you have different concerns than some of those people. So uh, uh, he is here to answer them. He is a student of, uh, in addition to being a very experienced journalist, uh, he is a student of uh, journalism and mass media and all sorts of other things, that, uh, some of which are interesting. So uh, I'll start. Do you miss it? How do you miss being in the newspaper game? Uh, my standard uh, response has always been, I don't miss the rat race, but I miss some of the rats. And, uh, uh, more seriously, I love the life of the newsroom, and I was lucky enough uh, to be part of a generation that saw what I think are the last great dramatic days of newspaper journalism of the old style in this country. And so the, the, being, in the, in the, uh, being in a great newsroom was like stepping inside a movie every day. Uh, and, and that I do miss. I do not miss deadlines. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I thought, I'll, I'll add this briefly about deadlines since I think it's important for anybody Think about writing and think about pressure. I, my ambition as a reporter at three, three Alabama papers, the Atlanta Constitution and the St. Petersburg Times, was to work my way up the reporting ladder so that I got to be a specialty writer so I didn't have to deal with daily deadlines. Uh, and I had pretty well done that. Uh, so people like Foley wouldn't bother me while I was at work <laughs> <laughs> or sitting at my desk. When I got to the New York Times, I was 35 years old, and I discovered that to be a successful reporter at the New York Times, in any discipline, you had to be an excellent deadline reporter. So I reschooled myself to write fast and every day, just when I thought I was escaping that particular uh, burden. And so your go the goal for any newspaper writer, I think, is to, to be to write better than anyone who can write faster and faster than anyone who can write better. And uh, then, oh. then you'll succeed on deadline. I like that. That's good. How'd you get into journalism? Uh, accidentally. Uh, <laughs> it was the uh, summer after my senior year, and I was wandering uh, around the student union at my little college in Birmingham. And a guy uh, said, we were, I think, looking at the employment building board said, hey, uh, you hear they're hiring cub reporters at the Birmingham Post-Herald. And so I went down there, and I was interviewed by a dragon named Bill Lindley. That was back in the era when they fed babies and puppies to managing editors every day. <laughs> Ferocious bit. He, wherever he is, and I, I, I don't know which direction to point, he'd be pleased to be remembered as a dragon. In any event, he hired me on that day and during the interview, I neglected to mention that I could not type. 
<laughs> so uh, that made for a couple of lively, uh, <laughs> lively weeks. You made it in English. Uh, you wanted to be a, a great American right. novelist. Yeah, I wanted to be a novelist. You still do. Uh, well, I'd like to be a profitable one. I think great may be a, a, a yeah. bit of a, uh, a leap. But I, I was an English major, and like many people of my generation, I thought what the South really needed was another writer who tried to write like William Faulkner. And uh, so I'm, journalism saved me from that. <laughs> Talk about September 5th, 2001. Well, actually, talk about the six days later, September 11th, 2001. You just inherited the, the, uh, uh, the executive editorship, the commander, uh, commander's role of, of the biggest newspaper, the best newspaper, and, and everybody expected everything from you and your team. What happened? Uh, I, was, uh, I lived in Greenwich Village, quite near the Twin Towers. And I was uh, a bachelor in those days, and I was in my uh, kitchen area at the table where I read the morning paper and watched the morning shows. Un untypically, I had not turned on the TV. I usually like to see the seven o'clock news block on one or another news show. Phone rang and it was my publisher who uh, said, have you got your TV on? And I said, no. And he said, a remarkable thing has happened. They, they hit one, some, a plane flew into one of the, tw one of the towers. So I did turn uh, I started getting dressed. I still had not, re I turned the TV on and saw what was happening. This is still one tower. And uh, so uh, I ran to, to get dressed. And the phone rang again. He said, well, the second one, the second one just hit. He, and which let us know firmly that this was not an, an air travel accident, that it was a purposeful act. Of, of uh, some sort. And the, the scene that's riveted my mind most firmly of the next few minutes was I went outside and I lived near St. Vincent Hospital, which is a historic hospital in New York. It's where Dylan Thomas died of al alcohol overdose. Uh, and his last words were at the nearby tavern, the White Horse Tavern, which was 15 whiskeys. I think that's a record. <laughs> uh, but it was a much more somber occasion than that, of course. Uh, uh, it's also the hospital where, where the original, much of the original AIDS result, uh, AIDS research was done because Greenwich Village was, of course, a, a hotbed of, of, uh, of contagion in, in that area. Anyway, the entire medical staff, I would say 300 people, were lining the sidewalks outside the emergency room in their green scrubs uh, with gurneys. And that really was a sobering sight uh, to see. I mean, it, uh, obviously, if you reflect on it, it was good they were there. It was professional. But still, it's sort of, you know, this is a real-time tragedy. And tragically, the people they were expecting to receive at the emergency room, very few, uh, very few came because there were so few survivors. And so the wall of that hospital, which I saw every day on, when I left for work, became the first of those walls of grief where people would post, you know, uh, my husband, Joe Smith, last seen such such a date. If you know his whereabouts or what happened to him, please let me know. It was a heartbreaking uh, sight. And I remember also two other things, uh, one of which, uh, I, I'm not particularly proud of, but I, uh, I did it. One of the things I learned over, as a reporter over the years is if you run into a problem, an operational problem, throw money at it. And so I hailed a cab. I said, I need to go uptown to the Times. He says, well, I'm trying to get downtown. Uh, and I said, well, I'll give you uh, double the user fare. And so I think I wound up saying, I'll give you $50. And I found out his daughter was down there, and he didn't know what had happened to her, so I felt terrible. Uh, at that point, but none of us uh, realized the scale of what was going to happen. And, uh, and uh, then I s the pickup truck there. And pickup trucks uh, in New York City are very much like pickup trucks in the South. They're usually carrying uh, workers with ponytails who would rather be smoking dope. And, uh, <laughs> and there were three guys there, plumbers, and I started chatting to them. I said, do you all know what happened? They said, no, all we know is we were supposed to be down there working this morning, and it blew up before we could get there. And that, to me, that show, those two incidents showed how 
immediately the, the impact of that event shot through a city that is, is almost impossible to stop, but it, uh, that stopped it uh, that day. So I could go on and on, but anyway. Uh, we, the, the staff performed magnificently. The, that paper that we did that day uh, remains, uh, to my mind, the signature paper that I was ever part of. And much of Lower Manhattan at that time was shut down. And so the paper had to resort to, uh, we could deliver uptown, but at the Times Building they were selling these papers out of, out of the delivery bay where the, where the delivery trucks normally stop and just sell on them like hotcakes, people, hundreds of people streaming by to try to find out what was going on. Hmm. Interesting, and, and after that, uh, your coverage of that, won, uh, you won a record seven Pulitzer Prizes that year uh, for that part of that coverage, uh, including uh, Portraits of Grief. Yeah. Uh, Portrait of Grief was a daily section. We discovered the first day, and certainly by the second day, it became uh, a, a significant problem once we got past the initial burst of, of the event. You can't write a standard obituary on someone who's probably dead, but you don't know it. For all you know, they may have made it to a hospital or something. So we, we came up with the, one of the uh, a young women on our, our copy desk came up spontaneously the idea of we would write, as we found out about people who were in the buildings, we would write a vignette, uh, portraits, of the, uh, portraits of grief, we called it. And it was uh, information from the families. And typically, uh, if we knew they were dead, if the family had learned that, of course, we, that would be part of the story. But if not, uh, it would be, the story would be like a snapshot of a, a life being lived what the person liked, what their passions, enthusiasms were, what their profession was, what their, who their loved ones were, and then bang, it stops because you don't know the, uh, you don't definitively know the rest of the story. Very moving, there was a, a, you published a book uh, containing really, yeah. really terrific And we stuff. did virtually every victim except those whose families did not want to be included, and we didn't push that, but it, as it turned out, I think, uh, somewhere in the high 90 percent wanted their, wanted their relatives memorialized. So then you had this incredible high of seven Pulitzer Prizes and huge success because of this terrific journalism you right. were producing. And then uh, a few months later, Jason Blair happened. Yeah, well, it was a little more than a year later. Was it? Yeah. Well, you know, that, that out of that, uh, uh, I, I just learned this this week in my reading that, uh, that, that your name became a verb. On the oh, Gilmore right. Girls, uh, in the Gilmore. Oh, really? Science. Somebody, <laughs> somebody saw. I, I knew both of them very well. Uh, what was? <laughs> and uh, there, well, apparently, the woman was being forced out of her job as editor of the Yale paper, right. and, and she said, "I've been hall ranged." Oh, good. <laughs> that's, that's an achievement. Now, forget the poll. Always glad to offer Yaley. Uh, <laughs> Talk about the, Jason. Well. Uh, <laughs> The, this period, I became controversial uh, for a number of reasons. The, the main one for this was I, I came into the New York Times determined to be a change agent. I knew that we were the best paper in the United States, possibly the world, but I also knew that our, sec, that our circulation and advertising revenue had been declining for 30 years. And at a certain point, you can't blame a decline in circulation on the audience. They're not smart enough to, pre to present, to absorb what we're presenting. We've got to get better at our presentation and as good as it, it is. And it was a very, very talented but very complacent newsroom. So I was doing a number of things to raise the energy level and make it more mer meritocratic. So younger uh, people, uh, particularly great talent, could, could move up more quickly than, than in a normal bureaucracy. Uh, so, I was actually, I did get married during, uh, during uh, these first few months uh, that I was in the job and uh, I was on a delayed honeymoon, delayed because of the Afghan war, and I got a call from the managing editor who said that we had had a report that Jason Blair, one of our reporters, had been plagiarizing work from other reporters. And it quickly emerged that he had been falsifying. Uh, as well as plagiarizing. And 
I made an immediate decision that I am convinced was the right one for the paper, and uh, it, although it wound up costly for me in career terms, uh, I decided that the most important, I had been a fan since Watergate of the, individ, uh, the independent prosecutor law, which is there are certain kinds of events that you want to reassure the public that they're being investigated independently rather than investigators investigating what they did. Uh, so I, uh, my first act upon getting back to the office was, uh, uh, well, the first act was, was I read Jason's entire personnel file and I saw that he was a deeply troubled individual uh, who had, uh, had, should never have been promoted to staff reporter as, as he had been uh, about two years before I became executive editor. So he had, he had, uh, he had uh, wormed his way through our personnel system, uh, gotten a job he shouldn't have had based on the merits. But that's really not the, the nexus of Jason's story is he's, he uh, was a person who consistently exhibited sociopathic uh, behavior. And that's something in life that I hope you don't have to cop to, to uh, deal with, but it's very, you can't predict it, and it's irrational in terms of how you analyze it. It's like the situation where a hospital nurse is discovered to be, to be delivering lethal injections to, to patients when they're left alone, which does happen. So you've got, in the hospital example, several hundred people doing everything can to save lives and one person strict, secretly working to undermine the entire mission and take lives. So we had 1,100 reporters and editors trying to put true facts in the paper to find out what was the factual situation, put the facts in, and, and Jason promiscuously and purposely putting lies in our paper. So back to the independent. I, I thought the most important thing was for the Times to reassure its readers that we were willing to fully disclose what happened, that we would be as investigatively energetic and truthful about our mistake, embarrassing as it was, as we would be if the president or the Congress or some individual got caught in a criminal act. Oh, this was not criminal, but anyway, that was our standard. And so I, I appointed a group of eight reporters working under a very senior editor and their mission was to find out everything that they could and put it in the paper without me or any of the other editors, including Jason's immediate supervisors, getting to look at it. So there was no question that we were covering our assets. <coughs> because I think the one thing that modern political history has taught our nation is that the cover-up is, 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 is a terrible terribly insidious thing that undermines public confidence. So we published the longest independent in-house investigation that I think any <coughs> newspaper has ever published. It was something like 14,000 words. And it had the effect that I wanted it to have, which was uh, to reassure our readers that this was an individual aberration and that the time did not have a systemic rot and that uh, we were, had, had, had done everything journalistically possible to tell everything we knew. And, and that worked, and I think it was a great, uh, a great saving thing for the paper's credibility. It wound up costing me um, personally because many in the newsroom, particularly those who were disaffected politically with what I was trying to do managerially, uh, began uh, circulating the idea that if I had not been pushing the paper so hard during 9-11, during the uh, Iraq War, during the Afghan War, that this mistake might not have gotten in. And there's really no rebuttal to that. Uh, so uh, all that said, I, I, I wish the outcome had been different. And frankly, I thought I had the political capital at that point to survive the scandal. So I didn't really worry about the impact on me. Uh, but it, w it wound up the uh, publisher uh, dismissing me, and uh, which was uh, which was painful. But uh, you know, as they say in the, in the swamp, it's big boy football out there. <laughs> Controversial. One of them, one of the descriptions I think in New York Magazine was I was a legendary autocrat. 
which I don't think that's too bad. Uh, <laughs> most newsrooms you'll discover are not democratic. Uh, the, my, pre my successor called me the last of the thunder and lightning editors. Uh, and uh, uh, he didn't mean it as a compliment, but I, I took it as such because I wanted to engender the feeling in that newsroom, any newsroom I was ever in, that we're going to commit journalism today. That's why we're here. Uh, we're going to let it rip. So, how did it feel to be, uh, as I said last night, on the other side of the notebook? To become, <laughs> you're in the spotlight. You're a newsmaker. You're no longer a news reporter. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's a. Some of you may have heard like I, I, it made me begin to wonder if there was in, by, in, in fact a divine plan to enforce fairness in the universe. As I had skewered so many politicians in my 20 years as a political reporter, uh, that uh, I was thinking, well, maybe you know it's my turn to get skewered, as indeed it was. Um, it's sobering. Being written about is sobering because it, it, there's so often so much inaccuracy. Uh, and if you're written about voluminously, a lot of what's there is true. Some will be speculative and may or may not be correct in its speculation. And some will simply be wrong uh, or stated by people who, who mean to harm you. And uh, one of the things that I learned uh, quickly, this was the early days of social media. People were not tw uh, texting. There was no Twittering. Uh, blogging was in its infancy. So I used an old-fashioned public relations strategy, which was, OK, we're going to take it on the chin, be hard on ourselves, then hunker down till the wind dies down, and then go back to doing what we do, which is a traditional, was a traditional PR tactic in the United States and politics and many other fields. <coughs> what we did, we did not know, I did not know, and, and what going viral meant. So our controversy went <coughs> viral inside our house. So I wound up, if, if you graded my public relations strategy on uh, a scale of 1 to 10, it was like a minus 4,000. I mean, it was disastrous <laughs> because it was oblivious uh, to what was happening to information uh, communication uh, in, in the new information age that, uh, that we uh, live in. But it, it, uh, it does not feel good to, uh, to uh, uh, be written about critically, particularly when you think you did the right thing. It, uh, but it's also sobering. It's a good maturing experience. It's never too late in life to achieve maturity. Um, <laughs> and a lot of people don't live long enough for that to happen. Uh, so what you learn is that when you're in a crisis like that, the important things you still have. Your family is healthy. Uh, <laughs> Your dog still loves you. <laughs> Life goes on, and so it, it does uh, make you appreciate what you have. If some, you know, terrible things happen to people. What happened to me is nothing on the scale of losing a a loved one in that building at, uh, on on 9/11. All right, budding journalists, it's your turn. What do you want to know? As you can see, uh, Mr. Reigns is, is candid and open and frank and all those things. Um, after everything happened with Jason Blair, did you uh, get in contact with him? Have you spoken to him? No, I haven't. Uh, it, it, my colleague, my late colleague, Gerald Boyd, the managing editor who died tragically of lung cancer a, a, a few years after, he, he and I were both dismissed at the same time. Uh, I'll never forget what Gerald said very early in the, uh, in the episode, first couple of days. We were alone to us. He said, you know, I just figured something out. After looking at the competition level among our young reporters and editors, Jason decided that he could not become famous, so he would become infamous. I thought that was a brilliant insight. Uh, and, but it, but it doesn't go pure, I mean, I'm not angry at Jason because I think he is, was and is a disturbed person. Sociopathic behavior is, is a kind of behavior that people have no control of. So, you know, I, uh, I, I have, have, had, had, have not had feelings of hatred for him, uh, but I have not wanted to go fishing with him. So, uh, <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't uh, 
the same uh, same image. In the back. Um, online media is really transforming journalism. I'm sorry. Online media is really transforming journalism, and I think that um, going back to your coverage of September 11th, with your, you covered it very um, sensitively, and I think you did a great job, obviously. Um, I was wondering if how important is sensitivity in journalism? Because I think sometimes with things like the media, we're getting lost. We're becoming an afterthought. Sensitivity is a, is a casualty of, of immediacy. Yeah, uh, this is something I've thought about a lot, and I think it's very important for your generation. In my generation of journalists, we knew uh, what we were communicating. We had time to research it uh, and, and uh, apply certain standards. And that uh, preparation time has disappeared. The internet is the most powerful communication force in a human history, the printing press pales beside it. It is also morally neutral and truth neutral. You can go on right, we can go on right now and read, get brain surgery advice from a guy sitting in his mother's basement in his bathrobe and house shoes <laughs> typing, typing medical information. And, and that's an extreme example, but that is the real, uh, the instantaneous nature of communication now is not only uh, a new thing, uh, we ha we're in early days learning how to deal with it, how to police it. Uh, it's unfortunate that the adversarial and uh, gladi gladiatorial warlike part of human nature, which is real and exists in the world, and is a force in history, seems to be come to the fore with a lot of individuals with having uh, access. And that, you know, I remember one of the early days of, of, of emailing would read about people getting flamed, you know, and which I'm sure is now a widespread part of the culture. But the other thing for journalists to remember about the internet is that it appeals to the one of the most basic instincts of human nature. That is an instinct on the, several, on the level of reproductive urge, uh, getting food, getting shelter, and that is to have one's writing published instantly without editing. <laughs> and that is a very uh, dangerous uh, and new thing. It's something uh, that you'll have to, I, I, I'll give you one practical bit of advice that I think would still serve. Uh, and that is never send an email after having a drink or imbibing other consciousness expanding substances. <laughs> <laughs> and I followed that religiously and I'm glad, glad I do. But, but you know, the other thing is that we're getting the, the very unusual experience of real time feedback. We're recording in our wa and watching ourselves simultaneously and Mike and I were just talking about, it is amazing to me how in every campaign, some candidate says something stupid, calls his or her opponent a jerk, uh, condemns 47% of the population. Uh, and the reality is, if you are a public figure in America, everything is on the air all the time, period, full stop. And indeed, if you're an average citizen, much of your activities are being recorded when you're not aware of it, you know, the surveillance cameras, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, it's a, it pr presents a new behavior and etiquette uh, environment. Yes? Do you think you could have done anything differently to spare your job at the New York Times, and would you have done it? Um, I would not have done anything differently in terms of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, remedy that we prescribed, a full, full disclosure. Yes, uh, you know, the journalism trains managers the way the Army selects officers. They are chosen, officers are chosen from the second lieutenants who don't get killed early in the war. And managing, managing uh, uh, expert, 
teaching managing expertise is not a not a feature of newsrooms or was not in my generation. That's so. Yes, I. Uh, the agenda of changes that I thought were necessary for the future success of the paper, and I believe those changes are still necessary, I would have tried to impose in a more, uh, uh, in a softer, nicer way. Uh, one of the things that you'll discover as you go out into professional newsrooms, unless things have changed a very great deal, <laughs> niceness is not a widespread quality uh, in that world. That is absolutely true. Yes. <laughs> about the agenda of changes, and you said that you would still implement them. Could you expand on that? What are the changes? Yeah, well, it's a good, it's a good, uh, I'll try to give you a short answer. One, <laughs> I want to change the work ethic. Times is traditionally a unionized, unionized paper. It's like getting into Harvard. Once you get in, you can't flunk out. I felt that we were operating, we were too relaxed, to sitting on our laurels and not fighting hard enough to be competitive with with every uh, with every resource that we had, we were underutilizing our resources as a paper, and I think the the uh, the declining profitability and availability of the paper over three decades shows that to have been the case in the print world. Uh, so that was what I was trying to do, energize an already talented but somewhat lazy uh, environment. Uh, and, and the implications of that go across the board. Uh, seniority used to be a big principle at the time. So if a mediocre person got an important job with any sort of good luck, they might hold it for two decades. Uh, and so you, you know, clean out the traffic system so, so the talented and the energetic can have their day uh, uh, while they're at their, at their uh, peak talent and performance levels, that sort of thing. Um, the, the one thing that I regret that I didn't get done, I almost did, and it happened today. If you read the paper, the New York Times has changed the banner, the flag of the International Herald Tribune to the International New York Times. When I was executive editor, we bought the Herald Tribune for $65 million, as I recall. And the entire purpose of buying the International Herald Tribune is because it had an international platform and we had already learned through the internet that we had an international market for our brand. Uh, New York Times is a global brand. And the day that I left the building, I had the dummies of the new uh, front page of what of the old International Herald Tribune on my desk which said International New York Times and we had several variations of that. Uh, so we were, you know, we were going to pull the trigger on that change which was going to happen in 2003 and now it's happened in 2013 and it's overdue but I think the Times has the best website I have seen in the newspaper business. Uh, and if we can, if, if the management can learn how to make money with that quality digital journalism, the way for many years we made money with quality uh, uh, print journalism, then it's going to be a good, uh, it's going to survive. It'll remain an emblem of quality, which it is. And I hope it will be so prosperous that it can pay my pension for the next uh, 30, 40 years, I hope. <laughs> good move. Yes, Colin. Uh, which part of your journalism career did you enjoy the most? Ah, uh, the, the, uh, the two years I spent in St. Petersburg were great. <laughs> uh, because the publisher, Gene Patterson, knew the style of political reporting I did, which was the style of the Atlanta Constitution, which was very aggressive. Uh, and he also hired me to do that and, and put out the word that Foley and others couldn't bother me while I was doing it. That's a joke. But I was given a really kind of a joke. <laughs> I was given a really wide mandate to to do activist political reporting and I had such a great time. Uh, and uh, it was interesting in fact last night in the Graham Center because one of the first profiles I did was Bob Graham then a a uh, you know a poor hard working millionaire's son from Miami Springs 
uh, working his way up uh, the uh, political <laughs> ladder. And uh, those, those were great days. The other best job I ever had was editorial page editor of the New York Times because it's a great platform and it, I felt, had been underused. The Times had a very dull, you know, it's an eat your peas kind of journalism, you know, read this, it'll be good for you, right, you know. Like, latest wisdom from John, but John Boehner or whatever. Um, I, I felt, I made a point of hiring writers who would invigorate the opinion pages and I had a great time doing it. I did that job for uh, nine years and it was a joy every day. Plus, the deadlines are much easier on the editorial page. Uh, the, the old joke in the, uh, in the uh, uh, newspaper business was that editorial writers are the guys who come down out of the hills after the battle and shoot the wounded. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a cushy way of life. <laughs> In the back, you tall guy. How did you manage a life while doing all that? Hmm? How did you manage having a life? You basically raised a son, you're down a band, you have a wife. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't have the same wife. That's part of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the life I live is very hard on uh, on family life, and I'm one of those people who spend a lot of time in the office that I could have uh, better spent at home. I am, however, very, or uh, not only at the office, I traveled, you know, I think the year that I covered Reagan's campaign, I was on the road 100 <coughs> days of 120 or something like that. In fact, at that time, my kids were like 10 and 12, or 8 and 10, just beginning to learn <coughs> that daddy is not God. So I would come home after three or four weeks and they have, would have imposed a whole new set of rules on how the house was being run. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, if I tried to reverse it, who is he? When did he get, it, anyway, it's hard on families. Uh, I'm lucky, but my former wife and I remain on, on good terms. She did a great job raising these kids, largely in my absence. My uh, older son, Ben Rains, is the chief environmental reporter for the uh, Mobile Register and the New House papers in Alabama and AL.com and he was nominated for a Pulitzer for his coverage of the oil spill and I think should have won it but uh, and he's an interesting new media story in that he went to the NYU film school so he goes into print journalism well now that the website is the main entity for his paper his video skills which are superior he can shoot underwater video he can do everything or you know have made him a very high demand uh, talent in that world. My younger son lives in New Orleans and he is the guitarist in a band called Galactic, which is well known there and, and plays around the world. So, and I think the most important thing is that you have to be subversive. <laughs> and that means you have to be willing to be seen, to, to be disagreed with, to seem to be wrong, and to always look at the conventional wisdom and say, I doubt it. <laughs> You'll sometimes be wrong and your reporting will let you know. But, and, and so here, here's what being, let me give you a, a real time example of subversive. A subversive way of thinking the world. A friend of mine used to call it walking around and looking at the backside of the moon. Um, my longtime uh, friend and colleague, Tom Brokaw, wrote a very good, worthy book called The Greatest Generation. It is about the noble efforts of young men sacrificing themselves to prolong the life of their country. That's a good book. It's a worthy book. Joseph Heller wrote a great book about the same war called Catch-22. And it was about the much more challenging idea that's been demonstrated throughout human history that at one level, wars are really exercises in which old men figure out arguments over which they can send young men to die. And that's the message of Catch-22. So that's the difference between good and great. One is accepting of the status quo. It's good we had a war. 
it's good we want it. Uh, it's, it's too bad people got killed, but they, it, was, it was a great, great thing. And the other is, well, let's look at this in a, in a more deeply, uh, deeply uh, human way. Uh, so another way of saying it, do you want to be a critic or a cheerleader? There's, there's room for both. Both George uh, W. Bush and Jimmy Buffett were cheerleaders in high school. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it requires a substantially different mindset. And it requires a, a, a thick skin. You, uh, observer or participant is another way of, of framing it. So. <laughs> In the Jason Blair scandal, mm -hmm. uh, it played affirmative action played this role demographically. My predecessor, twice removed, looking at the almost white, almost exclusively white uh, staff of the New York Times as late as 1986, and looking at the almost totally male levels of our uh, senior positions and the male predominance on our staff simply laid down a rule for every person, every hire we make of a white male, we're going to hire a person who does not fit that descriptive category. It may be gender, it may be race, it may be nationality. Uh, that brought a diversity to the times that I think made it a great deal stronger. Uh, I don't, so people have tried to make the argument that Jason was there because of affirmative action. I think w Jason uh, was, uh, that race was not an, uh, a factor uh, beyond being part of a broad and I think socially useful uh, 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 diversity project. Uh, Jason, again, you know, that's, it's dull, but this is the start and the end of the story. He is an aberrant individual who did great harm, and that's what sociopathic behavior does to people. Whether the sociopath kidnaps your child or burns your house or does something unconscionable in the workplace. Did, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Way in the back. You said you wanted to start as a novelist, yeah. and, now, and then you became a reporter, and then now you're a novelist and a reporter, which I find very interesting. What's the overlap between the two crafts? Uh, well, Hemingway said that if you spent more than six months as a newspaper reporter, you would never be a decent fiction writer. Uh, he made that universal principle based on the fact that he had been a newspaper reporter for six months before he sold his first novel. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, there is conflict between the disciplines. Uh, I found once I became fully engaged as a journalist that I had very little time for fiction, fiction writing. The, the novel that I wrote in, uh, that I published in 1977 called Whiskey Man, um, I started it in 65 and it came out in 77 and that was and I wrote the last chapter on a camp on a, on a uh, uh, airplane flying back from a Ronald Reagan political not it wasn't Reagan at that time from a Jimmy Carter political event uh, so you had I had to kind of do it in the in the uh, empty spaces now I'm struggling uh, uh, again as a writer. Uh, it's almost as if starting over. I had, because I had published a novel, I had convinced myself in the interim years I knew how to write one. Well, it turns out they're not as easy as I thought, and I forgot that it took me 13 years to do the first one. <laughs> so I'm trying to write a, a big canvas novel about the Civil War, and right now I'm in the shape the Confederacy was in after they burned Atlanta. I mean. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's a mess, uh, uh, and, but I, you know, I'm not quitting. You, uh, <coughs> Philip Roth said that one of the reasons he was retiring as a novelist at, at 80 was he no longer had the energy to s write three or 4,000 words and realize it was totally useless. Uh, and, uh, so but, and I'm all, so to, to keep my time well occupied while I'm letting the Civil War <coughs> resolve itself in my mind a little bit. I'm writing a contemporary novel set, uh, set in real time, and uh, 
uh, and I'm not talking about it too much because I don't want to uh, curse it. But uh, so I'm, I got two books going. All right, we're about out of time, but I want to thank Mr. Rance for taking the time. Thank you guys for your good questions. You made me look like I know what I'm doing, which is very rare. Thank you very much.